Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Joining us by phone, Ian Milheiser, senior correspondent at Vox. Um, Ian, welcome back to the program. Good to be here. Thanks so much. Um, a couple of cases that uh, wanted to uh, uh, talk to you about that are in front of the Supreme Court. Um, again, you know, we're just in the in the process of where they they've I've heard them or there we've uh, gone through oral arguments. Uh, so some of this is is speculation, but uh, the first one I'd love us I'd love you to explain to us is more v u s because I've tried to talk about it a little bit. Um, but it uh, at one point it starts getting pretty uh, Byzantine, it seems. and yeah. it centers around the ability to assess taxes on profits that have yet to be realized. In other words, someone has an asset and they haven't sold it yet. Uh, that's as far as right. I can get it. Uh, walk us through this. Yeah, I mean, this is a really complex case, but like the bottom line that you need to know about it is that it's a stalking horse to try to prevent very, very wealthy, very, very wealthy people from having their wealth taxed. And like the thing to understand there, so... For the most part, the federal government taxes your income. You know, it, it taxes the new money that you make. It does not generally tax people's wealth. So if I've got $50 million sitting in a stock brokerage account somewhere, or, you know, sitting in my art collection somewhere or something, the government generally won't tax that money. And there have been some proposals, you know, the leading ones from Senator Elizabeth Warren to ascend to to add a wealth tax to the federal taxation system you know the idea is that this is a way that we can start to get at the problem of wealth inequality this is a way that we can make sure that a few billionaire families aren't powerful for generations and generations to come and so this lawsuit is an effort to essentially shut that down before it happens and, and let me just say process. say this as by way of explanation. If I've got uh, fifty million dollars, let's say I I, I keep it in a CD because I'm very conservative mm -hmm. in that respect. But I'm getting five percent interest. the The money that that I make on interest there, uh, the two point five million dollars, that gets taxed. Um, That's correct. And or if I have fifty million dollars worth of stock which I bought for 30 million and I sell that 50 million dollars the 20 million dollars gets taxed um uh if I sell it but uh if, right. if I haven't sold it it's considered an unrealized gain because I haven't actually sold it yet That's correct yeah so the way the system works now is that people are generally taxed on their profits and not on the wealth itself and so you know, and, and then the other important point that you brought up is that the taxation typically doesn't happen until you sell your investment. So, you know, if, if you know, I don't have $50 million, but let's say I have $1,000 and I put $1,000 in the stock market and then I sell it a year later for $2,000, I am taxed on the $1,000 in profit that I make. And that rule that you're generally not taxed until it's called realization. You're generally not taxed until you, you sell or otherwise dispose of the asset is normally a pretty good rule. It's normally a pretty good rule because it's often difficult to tell how much an asset is worth until it is sold. So you don't want a situation where like, you know, someone has an asset, no one knows how much it's worth. And so no one knows how much money this person owes the government in taxes. But there are exceptions. There are actually lots of exceptions where people can be taxed on what's called unrealized income. They can be taxed on, you know, money, assets that have gained value, but that haven't, um, you know, but that haven't been sold yet. And the question in this case is whether to cut that all off and basically protect people who have huge stockpiles of wealth from being taxed on the wealth itself and not on just the income that they are. Now, just to be clear, we're talking about the federal government's ability here, right? Because I think right. a lot of people are very familiar that um, houses and property are taxed by your local governments. And, you know, I, I can maybe look on Zillow and get an idea of how much my house is worth. 
but I don't really know. And I may have bought the house for $250,000 and now it's worth three and a quarter uh, or something to that effect. I mean, that's so we do as a society, both on a, on a local level, at least uh, tax to unrealized gains, right? Because if your house goes up in value, even if you haven't seen that value realized, you get taxed on it. It gets reassessed. So is this this is that, that, a federal question? That, that's exactly right. Yeah. So your local government, you, you often have property taxes. You know, typically state and local governments have entire infrastructures in place that so they can assess the value of people's homes so they know what the property taxes are. The federal government historically has not had property tax. And one reason for this is that there's this bizarre provision of the Constitution that is at the heart of this Moore case. It says that direct taxes must be apportioned. And what that means is like if, say, Maryland has 8 percent of the national population, then 8 percent of the taxes collected, of the direct taxes collected, must come from Maryland. By the the federal government. By the federal government, that's correct. And that makes it next to impossible to have any kind of income tax or wealth tax, really any kind of tax, because wealth and income is not distributed evenly amongst you know, the population of all 50 states. The problem with this direct tax clause, though, is literally no one knows what a direct tax is. The framers didn't know. They wrote it into the Constitution as part of a compromise over slavery, and they didn't actually all agree on what this word means. If you read the Supreme Court's decisions, the Supreme Court's decisions make it clear that they don't really know what it means. And when they tried to say what it means, they just made something up. Um, and so essentially what the plaintiffs are arguing in this Moore case is that a tax on wealth or a tax on unrealized income violates this provision of the Constitution that no one knows what it means. And and we should also be clear that um the reason why the federal government can collect an income tax is because there was an amendment to the Constitution that was passed that would theoretically supersede that, right? The 16th Amendment would supersede that clause, but this is not uh, an income tax, and so they argue that it's it's not properly a proportion uh, apportioned. Is that right? So technically, it's a little comp- more complicated than that. So the reason we can have an income tax, you know, from like the founding until 1895, It was generally understood that we could have income taxes. And then in 1895, in a case called Pollock, the Supreme Court said that, no, you cannot have taxes on the income generated from investment. You, you can't have an income you can't have an income tax on on income generated from wages because of course the Supreme Court back then was controlled by robber barons. But you know, in eighteen ninety five they said you cannot have a tax on income from investment. And the, you know, pretty much everyone thought that decision was wrong. The 16th Amendment was enacted in order to overrule that 1895 decision. And so the way to think of the 16th Amendment isn't that, you know, we couldn't have income taxes and then there was this amendment and now we can. You know, technically the way to think about it is we could do it. Then the Supreme Court said no. And then we enacted an amendment to get rid of the mistake that the Supreme Court made in the Pollock case. All right. Uh, uh, fair enough. And and the the in this particular case, we're talking about um, monies or wealth, if you will, or value that's being taxed that is overseas. How could that apply to a portion to the states if they're if it's money from overseas? Right. Yeah. So. I mean, if the Supreme Court were to determine that this is a direct tax, then that would be, you know, then the plaintiffs would, then like the taxes have to be struck down. Because it's basically impossible to do a direct tax unless you just have like what is called a head tax, where you say like everyone has to pay $75 no matter who they are or something like that. That's the only way you can really do it in a way that's a portion. Um, but anyways, like the issue in this, the specific issue in this case deals with a tax that was part of the 2017 Trump tax bill. And what the, what the Trump tax law did is that it used to be that we tried to tax U.S. corporations who have money that is held in an offshore subsidiary. So, like, they create a a foreign company, they park their money in the foreign company, 
And we used to try to tax that money. And, you know, the sympathetic um, description of what they were trying to do with the Trump tax law is that Congress just decided it was too hard to tax that money. So, so we gave up on trying to tax foreign money that is held by U.S. corporations. And then we said, well, wait a second, like that's going to be really expensive to give up that taxing forever. So the law puts in place this one-time offset, which says that if you are a U.S. investor in a foreign company, then you have to pay one-time tax on the some of the profits that that company has earned. Um, all of this is very complicated, but like the reason why the specific tax here matters is because it's taxing people on on stock that is gained value but that has not necessarily been sold, unrealized income. And the question is whether it is unconstitutional to do that. And again, if it is unconstitutional to do that, that means that it's not just that this tax gets struck down. This tax is supposed to raise $340 billion, so it's not a small amount of money in place. It means that we can't have wealth taxes. It means that a whole bunch of other existing taxes. So if you, if you are a member of a partnership, if the partnership makes money, the individuals are, part, are, are taxed on it regardless of whether they receive that money or not, that would be unconstitutional. There's entities called S-Corps and F-Corps that are taxed in a similar way. You know, There's a long history of taxing foreign investments where like people can be taxed before they sell the asset. And if, you, if the Supreme Court strikes all of that down, we're potentially talking about trillions of dollars of money that just evaporates. All of a sudden, the federal government needs to figure out how to keep the lights on without hundreds of billions or potentially trillions of dollars in income that it was planning on. So it would be a really, really big deal if the Supreme Court were to strike down all these taxes. You know, the, the good news is, Based on the oral argument um, yesterday, they didn't seem to be much of an appetite for that. And and did was there ever a? I mean, uh, the the irony about all of this, I should just say, and that doesn't necessarily have any bearing on the case, is that the reason why we have this problem where uh, corporations would hide their their money offshore, and uh, you know we would beg them to repatriate it. We did it in two thousand four, and Bush gave them like a big discount on those on that taxation ostensibly under the uh the the bill called i think it was the american jobs act if i remember correctly which ended up um not creating any jobs in fact like one of the biggest right. um, sort of promoters of it i think at that time was like hewlett packard and they they cut like fourteen thousand jobs after uh their their off their their money was repatriated and then what happens is the corporations hold it offshore until the next republican who's going to come by and give them the same tax break but this, the idea that you could keep the money there and not have it taxed before it was repatriated was in and of itself a tax break that Eisenhower, uh, uh, that happened under the Eisenhower administration as a way of building up Europe and, 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 Japan, and, and Japan after World War II. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if Congress wanted to, at least under existing law, if Congress wanted to, it can tax U.S. companies on all of their income. So, you know, in, in, including the income that they, you know, you know potentially that, they, that, 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 that they, ah, let me try speaking again, including the income that they make overseas. Now, that said, I mean, we, we've chosen not to do that. There has been, you know, you know, a series of forgivenesses until, you know, this finally in 2017, Congress just said, we're going to give up on taxing this money. All of that, though, is, is, you know, sort of tangential to this case. Like, right. the issue in this case is, does Congress, does our elected representatives, and, you know, I don't like what they did in 2017, but, like, you know, does our, you know, should the people who are elected to set our tax policy get to decide that, or should it be decided by nine lawyers and black workers? And, you, you know, I mean, there really isn't a principled way to distinguish the tax in this Moore case from all these other taxes that exist. You know, there, there are, I mean, like Justice Alito was ranting against it because Justice Alito wants the Republicans to win every case and he wants Republican policies to be implemented. But if Justice Alito wants Republican policies to be implemented, and this is actually a Republican bill, which is the offset, um, you know, he could run for Congress. And he can have the proper branch decide what, what our Congress is. Instead, this case is an attempt to shunt these important questions, you know, who is taxed, how much are they taxed, 
to the one branch of government that is not elected and that currently has a Republican supermajority. Um, let's also, I just want to hear this clip from uh, Sonia Sotomayor, and, and, and you tell us just sort of like a, a how it, um, uh, uh, what she's referring to specifically in terms of like, um, they're being asked, according to Sotomayor, to essentially um, uh, announce what, a, a, put a definition of realization of profits, yeah. uh, create one that is sort of like a one size fits all. And here's uh, what she said. If what we do is to think about a particular tax, which would seems to be what we've been doing for over a hundred years, to see whether that tax is um, is income as understood by attribution or as an excise tax or by other principles, um, we wouldn't have to give. Uh, we would consider each tax on its own form. You're asking us to just announce what realization is out of context. And for the last hundred years, we've been studiously avoiding doing that because we recognize that it's dangerous to do that. To, to state a, a word like realization, we then have to come up with a working definition that applies to every piece of property and every way in which people um, uh, gain wealth. It doesn't seem logical to me. All right. We, you, so uh, just, uh, I mean, walk us through that. She's basically saying that we c you can't run a government that way because uh, there is no one size fits all different contexts and different and sort of like, I guess, innovation, financial innovation uh, calls for you to have like agencies deal with this. Yeah. So like, I mean, the I think the background to what she's saying there is that wealthy people have really good tax lawyers. And they have really good tax lawyers who, like, a lot of what they do is they call through the tax code or they call through Supreme Court decisions defining a particular term. And then they will design, you know, whether it is an investment, whether it's a trust, they will design some sort of system that technically does not fit in that definition. And so, you know, one risk you have is that if the Supreme Court comes up with a one-size-fits-all definition of an important tax concept like realization, then tax lawyers will come up with some sort of vehicle that just doesn't fit into that definition, but still allows investors to earn the same amount of money that they would earn otherwise. And so you just wind up having all of this, un all, all, all of this untaxed income. The other problem is that it skews the investment market. So, like, let's say the Supreme Court comes up with a definition of what is realization, and that definition excludes, I don't know, money that is earned in the state of Idaho. What's going to happen if the Supreme Court comes up with that definition is that everyone's just going to move their money to Idaho, and, like, corporations are going to relocate their headquarters in, in Idaho, and, like, everyone's going to try to, like, get – some sort of connection to Idaho and their investments, because that way they can avoid taxes. And that's you know not how we want a market economy to work. We don't want people to make investment choices based on what's going to help them avoid taxes. We want people to make investment choices based on what they think is most likely to you know be a good investment. Right. All right. Well, and uh, so I guess we'll find out how they rule in uh, in June or July on that one but um as far as you could tell from the questioning it doesn't look like it's going to be um uh as as, as problematic as uh, problematic as it could have been i i think that's right i i mean they, they might write a very narrow opinion that sort of leaves open the question of what happened if elizabeth what happens if elizabeth warren gets the majority she needs to pass her wealth tax <laughs> right but i think yeah but i think they realize that like regardless of what they think about some hypothetical future tax that probably will never get passed anyway, they shouldn't hand down a decision that nukes so much of the current tax code that the federal government can't keep the lights on anymore. Um, let's move to uh, SEC versus Jarkezi, Um or Jarkezi? Um I think it's, I think it's Jark Jarkezi. Jarkezi. Um, yeah. this is a case which, and you know, I don't know for how many years that we've been having you on and we've been talking about, 
uh, things like uh, the non-delegation doctrine or right. uh, the Chevron uh, doctrine, um, uh, and now the the so-called major questions doctrine, which right. I think you and I have actually been I've been interviewing you longer than that has existed in practice. Um, uh, but it is a one that is like sort of. Uh, completely uh, uh turning over the apple cart in terms of like uh, american jurisprudence as far as i can tell but this concept that essentially uh would both and or inhibit congress from um from delegating authority to agencies where they have expertise and also the deference that courts have to these agencies when agencies are making you know questions of 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 executing and developing regulations to carry out uh, congressional will, um, this is a case that could have touched upon that as well. Yes. So okay. So what this case involves? Now, first of all, the SEC is the federal agency that protects investors from fraud by from the companies they're investing in. It has existed since the Roosevelt administration, and the relevant laws governing the SEC haven't been changed in more than a dozen years. So despite all of that, the Fifth Circuit, which is, you know, the Trumpiest court in America, you know, a, a court that is, you know, seems to be looking for ways to sabotage the federal government, declared that the SEC's methods for bringing enforcement actions against people who allegedly defraud investors violates the Constitution in three different ways. Now, I mean, just as a general rule, if you have an agency that's been around for 80 years and the laws governing that agency haven't changed in more than a dozen years, and someone comes along and says, hey, I found that this violates the Constitution, not one, not two, but three different ways, don't trust that person. Like, you know, if, if there's a lot of litigation in the United States, if something is unconstitutional, it only gets noticed fairly quickly. And if it doesn't get noticed fairly quickly, we certainly don't miss three different, you know, some of them very novel constitutional problems. So like, and particularly yeah. when but it comes start- to something like finance, right? I mean, that's right. uh, half their job is suing the uh, U.S. government in terms of like uh, trying to uh, release themselves from regulation. Right. Yeah. Like this is a case about securities fraud and like there's lots of money Obviously, it's security. You know, companies have an interest in both knowing what the law is and in challenging the law if it hurts them in any way. So, like, you know, if there was a serious violation going on, you would think someone would have found it by now, much less three of them. Um, but anyway, so here, here's what the issue is that at least the Supreme Court cared about. And, and the good news is that the Supreme Court looks likely to shrink this case, although they still look likely use it in order to diminish, you know, some of the federal government's ability to govern. So the SEC has these officials that are called administrative law judges. And what administrative law judges are is they are judges who are experts in securities fraud. And so if the SEC brings an enforcement action against someone, in this case, they brought it against a hedge fund that's accused of defrauding its investors, they have the option, instead of bringing it before what's called an Article Three court, you know, sort of generalist courts that hear all sorts of issues, they have the option of bringing it before one of these administrative law judges. And, you know, a big reason why the SEC would want to do that is because these judges actually know what they're talking about. You know, securities fraud is really complicated. Um, you want judges who understand, not, you know, not just the law of securities fraud, but they like understand the business here. You know, understand the concepts that they're going to be dealing with, because people who know what they're talking about are more likely to get the answer right. And so that's why you have these administrative law judges. Um, the Supreme Court seemed very concerned that this administrative law judge process doesn't allow for jury trial. And, you know, again, like, I think the reason why it doesn't allow for jury trials would be pretty obvious, because the whole point of these administrative proceedings is that you want the case to be heard by an expert and not by, you know, 12 randos who probably know nothing about securities law. And we should say these are not criminal cases, right? These are civil cases. Yes. 
Yeah, that, and that, that is an important point. These are not criminal cases. If you're being accused of a crime, you have an absolute right to a jury trial. That's the Sixth Amendment. If you're not accused of a crime, if it is a civil case, there, the, the, the Seventh Amendment of, to the Constitution says that in some civil cases you're entitled to a jury. But, like, I mean, it's, it, the, the phrase that he uses is at common law. Like, basically, it means that you are being sued under a provision that, you know, uh, under a legal doctrine that has that derives from common law principles that have been around since, like, the pre-colonial years. Um, rather than being sued under a statute, rather than being sued under an act of Congress. Um, but in any event, you know, the Supreme Court, based on at least what I heard in the oral argument, probably isn't going to accept any of the more Baroque, like, let's destroy the whole federal government's ability to operate theory that the Fifth Circuit latched on to. But I think it is likely to say that these sort of expert forums that exist probably cannot continue to exist, at least not in their current form. Uh, and we should say that, like, um, the, you know, the number of administrative courts, if you will, in the federal government, like, we're talking, like, this is, we have this in, in immigration, we have it in, um, uh, I mean, all sorts of, like, uh, regulatory enforcement in the country. This, I mean, it, it would be devastating. And n- not to mention, just, like, from yeah. a practical standpoint, like you would have to ramp up the federal judiciary, but uh, as uh, but but in terms of like having judges not be um, sort of I guess well all political appointments as well, um, you know, so that we could know before someone even gets into the courtroom how they're going to rule on this case. Um, what I get so I let me. I, all right. So you, your sense is that that is going to remain intact and that's not going to be that much of a, a problem, although they're they're going to do their best on this. Let me just ask you this. Why does the Supreme Court hear these cases that like seem like they're swinging for the fences? Yeah, it's a good it's an excellent question. I mean, it's a particularly good question because at least this term, it seems that like even in this right-wing Supreme Court, a lot of the justices are looking at some of these cases and going, whoa, that, that, that's too far even for us. So I, I think there's a few phenomena going on here. One is just that lawyers are smart, and when they see the Supreme Court move to the right, right-wing lawyers will bring more cases, and you know, more lefty lawyers will not bring a lot of lawsuits because they don't want to lose. And so you see more Hail Mary cases bring, being brought because you just have more right wing lawyers saying, well, well, now I've got a shot with this with, with, with this argument. So that, that's one phenomenon. The second phenomenon is you have judges, you know, especially on the Fifth Circuit, but, you know, in, in other places, too, who are very partisan, who want to push the law to the right, who want to force the Supreme Court to hear issues by, like, striking down some exorbitant amount of the federal government and then requiring the Supreme Court to step in and pick up the pieces. And you also have a lot of judges on these lower courts who are auditioning, you know, who, who want Donald Trump to promote them to the Supreme Court. And they think if they make a big splash and show like, look, I'm on the cutting edge of Federalist Society thinking that, you know, this will help them catch the eye of, of a Republican president in the future. So, you know, you have a, a few phenomena going on, going on here. Um, let me let me just ex- not. Let me yeah. just explain uh, or, or, or have you explain to people like so if you're talking about like the Fifth Circuit of uh, um, uh, the Fifth Circuit, uh, which you, you describe as the most Trumpiest of, uh, of circuits, um, you're talking about, um, you know, five or six states. Um, I can't. So remember. the Fifth Circuit is the Fifth Circuit is Texas, Louisiana and Mississippi. OK, so if you bring a if you bring a federal lawsuit or you are sued in Texas. Mississippi or Louisiana, when your case is appealed, it will go to the it will go to the fifth, sir. And the reason and, why the Supreme Court needs to hear that case is because um, if they were to rule that the SEC can't use administrative judges out of the fifth cir- circuit, and that was to let stand, and the, and the Supreme Court didn't address it, then in those in that jurisdiction. They wouldn't need to use. Uh, they they wouldn't be allowed to use uh, administrative judges, right? So the Supreme Court is obligated 
to hear that case. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they're not literally obligated in the sense that, like, you know, nothing's going to happen to them if, right. they, if they don't hear the case. But the point of the Supreme Court, the reason why we have one court at the top of our whole judicial system is to maintain the uniformity of federal law. You know, you, you don't want a situation where federal law means one thing in Michigan. It means a completely different thing in Texas. Is there a dynamic um, where Roberts at this point in the wake of Dobbs and in the wake of like these clear ethical issues that the court is having that Roberts is like, if we can have cases where, uh, you know, the question is around, should we essentially have a functioning federal government? And we weigh in with a, uh, um, a result that is yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A begrudging. Yes. I mean, is, is this part of Robert's sort of like mentality of like, I need to, um, bail some water here at a time yeah. where the Supreme court legitimacy is in serious question. Yeah, I, I mean, you, I mean, my short answer to that is you'd have to ask John Roberts that. Right. But, like, just as, you know, from what I can tell from the outside looking in, like, the Supreme Court, like, yeah, actually, well, this group of Republican justices, the six Republican justices who sit on the Supreme Court right now, came in with a pretty clear agenda. They had, like, a list of boxes they want to check. You know, we're going to get rid of Roe v. Wade. We're going to get rid of affirm affirmative action. We're going to give ourselves a veto power over any decision made by a federal, federal agency. We're going to give religious conservatives, and specifically Christian conservatives, broad exemptions from following federal and state laws. Like, you know, they, they had an agenda. And... You know, I even wrote a book about that agenda called yep. The Agenda. And as it turns out, they have now, like, fulfilled that agenda. Like, they have checked all their boxes on the list. And so one possibility is that, they're, you know, Roberts and maybe Kavanaugh are looking back and saying, man, like, everyone hates us right now. We should probably hand, hand the liberals some victories so, like, we don't look like a bunch of partisan hacks. You know, the other more optimistic possibility is what's going on here is like they've come in with their list, with their checklist of things that they're going to accomplish. They have now finished every, you know, they've now checked all the boxes. And so having checked all the boxes, they still, you know, they still have a job as a Supreme Court justice and they still have all these cases coming. And in the absence of the agenda, the optimistic take is maybe they're going to be real judges now. You know, you know, maybe, maybe like now that they've done all the things that like, you know, mm. they were picked to do, the, you know, maybe they're going to try to be real judges now. I, I think we need more information before we know which one of those is the case. But it does seem to be that in this term, they are trying to rein in the most, you know, the most absurd elements of the judiciary after spending the previous two terms checking off a bunch of boxes on an agenda list. Um, and I guess, I guess we will have to have you back in, uh, in, I don't know at what point we'll have a better sense of that. But in the meantime, uh, Ian, if you, you'll indulge me with like uh, two more, uh, quick cases, uh, two different, uh, oh, sure. cases. One is, uh, there is a case in front of the Supreme court now where the Sackler family, um, yeah. facing essentially bankruptcy for their family. And, and I mean that in a, in a colloquial sense. Um, essentially took Purdue Pharmacy into bankruptcy and sort of rolled their liability as individuals into that bankruptcy case as a way of protecting themselves, their, their personal money from creditors too. Um, and uh, I, I wonder your perspective on this. The Supreme Court is looking at this. Um, yeah. And, and, and this is a bankruptcy that is not available to your average Joe, as it were. I mean, uh, it, it, what, what's your take on this? Um, and, and, and how can we best understand this case? Yeah. So th this is a difficult case. Um, and, and, and so as I understand the issue here, um, so as part of the bankruptcy proceedings arising out of the opioid crisis, um, Purdue Pharmacy agreed, you know, the, the deal was re was reached that they would pay, I think it's $6 billion to help provide relief to victims of the opioid crisis. 
And as part of that agreement, the Sackler family themselves are basically immunized from the process. So like the $6 billion will come out of Purdue, Purdue Pharmacy, but all of the stockpiled wealth that members of this family that profited from, you know, providing opioids to, every, to, to everyone, like, you know, their personal wealth will not be touched. And the question is basically whether that should be allowed, whether we should be allowed to reach this deal where, you know, people are going to get a lot of relief, but, you know, these people who are bad actors, or at least who have profited, you know, some of them are, just, are the descendants of the, of the, of the bad sacklers. But these people who have profited from this family that did terrible things, whether they should get to hold on to their assets. And the answer is that, like, there's a whole lot of disagreement amongst the stakeholders in this case. So, like, it's a federal agency that's actually in court saying, hey, we don't think this arrangement is fair. There is a minority of the victims of the opioid crisis who are also saying, hey, we don't think this is fair. But there's also a lot of people who, you know, there are states that want to get their chunk of the relief money. There are individuals who want to get their, you know, there's a lot of groups that all are like, look, like this is the I, some combination of we think this is the best deal that we can get. And we're hurting right now. And we need that money. And, you know, punishing the, the, this family that did terrible things is a secondary importance. Um, I don't know where the Supreme Court is going to come out on this case. I, I mean, just as a as a moral and a policy matter, I'm not sure I, I have a view on where it should come out. Because, I mean, the, the tension here is the tension between wanting to help as many people as we can help right now and between making sure that this family isn't enriched for its unjust action. Right. Um, and lastly, let me ask you this uh, question because it, it, it's come up. Uh, there is 36 states that have uh, this legislation that says um, if you support BDS, you are, can't get a state contract. Uh, the most famous right. is that uh, case out of Texas uh, where a speech therapist uh, was uh, fired, uh, you know, working with the school district uh, because uh, they had supported BDS in some fashion or had a website or something to that effect. Um that case was came up to the Supreme Court, I think, in like uh, at the beginning of this year, and was uh, rejected. What What's your sense of like how does something like that get resolved? It seems so blatantly against the First Amendment. We hear a lot of people complain about lack of free speech because you know somebody got booed and chased off of a college campus, um, but right. this is a these are literally the government saying this is one type of protest we're going to punish you for. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't followed this case very closely, but, but I, I can give you some general First Amendment principles. Great. So it, it does sound sketchy. I mean, you know, the, the argument that these states can make is as a general rule, the government does have a lot of power over how it wants to spend its own money. And so if the government, like, you know, doesn't want to hire a particular, you know, you know, the federal government, especially in Democratic administrations, uses this power all the time to say, like, you know, if you want to get a contract with the federal government, you need to prevail. You need to pay up the prevailing wage. If you want a contract with the federal government, you cannot discriminate against, you know, the following individuals. And, you know, and we don't want the government to lose the power to say, if you want to work with us, here are the things that you need to do, because often that leads to a lot of, you know, a lot of very good worker friendly things happening. But all that but, is yeah. all that, from my understanding, has been tested in court as to whether it's a compulsion of speech. Right. Like right, the idea right. that and that like, like the right wing has always tried to say, like, you can't tell us that our employees have to wash their hands. You're you're compelling our our speech in right. some way yeah. like that. And that those have those have failed. So this is a it, it's it's one thing to say we want the government to be able to uh, impose certain requirements on contractors. It's another to say we want to inhibit their speech in a like right. pretty explicit way. I mean, this isn't like we're forcing you to, or keeping you from saying you don't have to wash your hands when you go out and serve people food. Um, right. This is pretty explicit. 
Yeah. So I, I think the way that I would handle it, and, and again, I haven't read the briefs in this case, so like there might be other case law I'm not aware of. But I think that I would analyze these using the rationale that the court has often used for government employees. So, like, the rule if you are a government employee is essentially the government can control what you say within the scope of your employment. So, like, if I am a math teacher employed by the state of Texas, I can't walk into class every day and decide I'm not going to teach math. I'm going to teach, you know, 16th century Japanese art history. Right. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with 16th century Japanese art history, but like once, but like I'm not. That's not what I was hired to do. I was hired to teach math, and the state can control my speech in that context. But when I am speaking about a matter of public concern, when I'm off the clock. And especially if I'm conveying information that, like, I might have special access to that there's a matter of public concern because I am, you know, because I'm inside the system, like, that is normally First Amendment protected speech. And so, you know, if Texas is hiring someone because Texas wants to convey a position on, you know, the Israel-Palestine conflict, I think it could tell, like, if it hires a PR consultant, to convey Texas's position that it is pro-Israel and anti-Palestine, I think that Texas could demand that that PR consultant say the thing that, it's, that the PR consultant is being hired to do. But if Texas is hiring someone to, you know, I don't know, provide school lunch, um, you know, your position on Israel and Palestine is irrelevant to whether or not you can provide school lunches. That person isn't being hired to have a to have a viewpoint on Israel. That person is being hired to provide hamburgers. And so I would think that in the case of the person who is not being hired for something that is any way relevant to Israel and Palestine, they're allowed to on their own time say what they want to say about Israel and Palestine. But again, I, I'd have to review the briefs in this case to like to give specifics about how I think it should come down. Well, uh, Ian Melheiser, I can't thank you enough for uh, walking us th- uh, through these things. Um, but you um, you made it possible for me not to have to finish law school uh, years and years ago. And, uh, I, I will. I, I, I the level of indebtedness I feel to you for that I cannot uh, express in words. Um, uh, Ian Melheiser, senior correspondent at Vox, really appreciate your time today. All right, thank you.